Good morning, folks. Welcome to the end of 2019. Another special video posted last night. Not sure we're going to get the next one out before the new year, but we're certainly going to try. Right now, we're at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last day on our star. Very calm in the photosphere and lower corona. The upper corona was another story, but we'll need a different satellite for that. First, let's check in on the solar wind, and we find plasma speed beneath 350 kilometers per second, a very calm stream, with the slight variations at that low range being all that's keeping the KP index up off the floor. When we come to Soho Lasco C2, we see Jupiter heading out from behind the Sun, just had its conjunction, and just afterwards we see a stealth CME pinch off to the right as the large trans-hemispheric coronal fields broaden and release. By the way, we not only have Jupiter readying to exit the Lasco frames, but Mercury just entered on C3. The two will cross paths here in a couple days, and indeed, confirming that on the official orbital diagram for the solar system, it is indeed Jupiter and Mercury there astride of our star. Let's go to Australia next. Can you see the smoke from their bushfires here? They are impressively captured on the Himawari satellite, with the fire temperature showing just how bad things really are. Just one frame towards the end there shows you exactly how terrible of a situation this has become. And while we're down here, there is a major news breaking about a heat blob off the coast of New Zealand. Well, yes, there is an above average water region here, but it's sitting next to a cold anomaly just to the east of it. And there is another large cold anomaly to the west of it in the Indian Ocean. When I pull the actual ocean temps, you can see where true temperature versus temperature anomaly really differ. Yes, we may have some high latitude sea temperature anomalies, but they're nothing like the true range of water temps from equator to pole. Checked in on the solar polar magnetic fields last night, by the way. Their data is up through December 2nd, usually three to four weeks behind, unfortunately. And best we can tell is that the yellow is set to cross the baseline for a solar polar field's magnetic reversal in terms of those to which the Earth is subject, and that is going to be happening here in the first month of the year. Looks like we're going to have the reversal and then the peak in January and April, respectively. Remember, those mean larger magnitude earthquakes. Saw a bit on Tony Phillips' blog yesterday about insane stratospheric clouds. Everyone who has seen it says it is unprecedented, a once-in-a-lifetime event. And until it keeps happening over and over again, that's not a bad description. But it's the chill in the stratosphere that brings them, and we're as cold as you get up there right now. By the way, this has a 5-10 to 10 year lag and blending, which tends to even out over the 11-year sunspot cycle. But, of course, the worry is that with the grand solar minimum coming later this century, this will begin to greatly affect the troposphere. And we're off to the oceans, focusing on circulation and, more specifically, the North Atlantic where scientists went out aiming to quell fears of the salinity-driven warm water belt collapse and triggering of a mini ice age. They ended up being able to say, uh, well, it probably won't, but that their findings are qualified by the actual levels of freshwater melt dumped into those oceans. If we get too much melting of the ice, it will indeed shut down the engine. And while the movie The Day After Tomorrow was way too extreme and it took only four days, you can't imagine how real it can actually get if that current breaks down. Not wholly unrelated is an open access piece out of Frontiers describing how the way we analyze data leaves us open to extreme events, for which we not only poorly identify the risk, but also the severity of the extremely bad outcomes. Ironic, on point, relevant, and again, free to read from Frontiers. Let's take a jump to the star-forming molecular clouds. Three years ago, every astronomer in the world would say gravity and chaotic collapse drive star formation in those regions, but after Sophia and Alma demonstrated it was magnetic fields and plasma turbulence, things are a-changing. Here, using the Zeeman observational effects, which occur when light is split into its spectral components by magnetic fields, they are indeed showing that turbulence is the key factor, and it occurs where the fields say so. Website members at suspiciousobservers.org. Your 100th Deeper Look episode on the year was actually part four of that Other Stars Super Flare examination. And right after this news post to YouTube, I will post the last link list of the year for a total of 101. The website memberships are indeed how we keep this ball rolling, how we keep it free for you here on YouTube. 100 extra episodes every year, a new podcast every week, email priority with asking questions, and much, much more. We greatly appreciate your support. 
there and here. And indeed, otf.cells.com. Today, it's the last day ever to get the PDF of Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, second edition. It'll disappear tomorrow with the third edition coming in a few months. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.